welcome to the distinguished lecture series. It's my great pleasure to, to welcome my old friend uh, and today's distinguished speaker, Charlie Weschler. Uh, he had to start, I'll be very brief because I want to give him more time. Uh, he had a distinguished career first at the Bell Labs and then after the Bell's, Bell Labs broke up at Bell Core. Um, and, and currently he is an adjunct professor, and I, and I often don't get this right, in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Medicine at the University of Medicine and Dentistry at New Jersey. And an adjunct professor at uh, School of Public Health uh, at the same university and a visiting professor at uh, University of Denmark, at the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, I think, as I recall my introduction to Charlie, uh, when I came back to LBL from India back in 1988, his name was spoken with awe and respect in the corridors of the indoor environment. At that time, it was indoor environment program now it is Indoor Environment Department. Uh, as somebody who founded the field of environmental, indoor environmental air chemistry. And uh, it's great pleasure to welcome him here. And without further ado, Charlie. Ashok embarrasses me. Uh, I am truly honored to be here. In terms of indoor chemistry, I should point out that Bill Nazaroff did his PhD thesis on indoor chemistry and came out in 1986, right Bill? Okay. okay, but I just want to make sure, you know, credit is given where credit is due. Uh, in 1991, I had the privilege of uh, doing a sabbatical here. I was here for uh, nine months. And uh, during that, that period, I worked with uh, Al Hodgson's my host was Joan Daisy, uh, Bill and Ashok and I did a paper together. Uh, it was, an, for me, truly a turning point in my career. It was an incredibly productive time. There were stimulating conversations going on all the time. What I'll be describing today literally grew out of experiments that I conducted during that sabbatical here at LBL. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to to be standing here, I see so many familiar faces, and uh, I, thank, I thank those of you I've had the privilege of working with for being such good colleagues over the years and for contributing to, uh, to what I'll be describing. And uh, let me proceed. Uh, give you a sense of the subjects I'd like to cover in the next 45 minutes or so. I'd like to discuss the reactive uptake on humans on our exposed skin, our hair, our clothing. I'd like to the reactive uptake of ozone and the production of oxidation products as a consequence. I'd like to talk about human occupancy potentially impacts the mixing ratios of two other indoor oxidants, the hydroxyl radical and the nitrate radical. I'd like to discuss interactions of human occupants with semi-volatile organic compounds pesticides, plasticizers, flame retardants. And I'll conclude by describing what we leave behind, what you find in a room that's been occupied, skin flakes and skin oils. But I'll begin by saying a little bit about skin. The more I read about skin, the more I'm impressed by everything skin does. Uh, there's a wonderful re review article that's uh, actually noted on the next slide, and the author of that particular review article describes skin as our external brain. And I think skin is indeed complicated enough to warrant that, that description. Uh, so when we speak of skin, typically people s speak of three layers, the subcutaneous layer, the dermis, and the epidermis. And each of these layers has sublayers. The epidermis, the very outermost layer of the epidermis, is the stratum corneum. It's the stratum corneum that's in contact with the air. And uh, the stratum corneum consists of corneocytes and skin oils. And the skin oils 
play an important role in modulating the permeability of the stratum corneum. The chemical classes of compounds that constitute the skin oils include mono dye and triacylglycerols, fatty acids, waxes, squalene, and squalene is one of the stars of, of this talk, and uh, sterols and sterol esters. And about half of the, uh, the four percent of the sterols and sterol esters is a compound you all know very well, cholesterol. Um, and you can see the relative contribution of these different chemical classes to, to skin oils. And uh, at the bottom is a, is a blow up of the stratum corneum. Now, these skin oils contain a number of chemicals that react with ozone at a very, very fast rate. The most abundant ozone reactive chemicals are squalene and the unsaturated fatty acids that are present in skin oil. And again, you can see the, uh, the concentration per unit surface area listed on the, on the slide. Um, we also have squalene, cholesterol, as I mentioned, but cholesterol is not as abundant as uh, squalene or the unsaturated fatty acids. And then we have lesser amounts of vitamin E and ubiquinone, which is also known as uh, CoQ10, and even smaller amounts of vitamin A, beta carotene, lycopene, ascorbic acid, glutathione, uric acid. So these chemicals protect skin from exogenous oxidative insult. Oxidative insult from the air that's in contact with, with our skin. I'd like to say a little bit more about two of these chemicals. First, squalene. Squalene, uh, I think, is a wonderful molecule. Uh, it has uh, 30 carbon atoms and six carbon-carbon double bonds. And it's these carbon-carbon double bonds that react with ozone. This is where the action is on squalene. Because we're talking about six double bonds in this molecule, squalene is capable of gobbling up six molecules of ozone, one squalene molecule. Now, when ozone and squalene react, we get a number of products, both relatively volatile products and products that are less volatile. Some of the more important volatile products are acetone, 6-methyl-5-heptene-2-ohne, and I'll refer to that as 6-MHO, geranyl acetone, and 4-oxopentanal, which I'll be referring to as 4-OPA. The other compound that warrants special attention is the most abundant unsaturated fatty acid. Its picture is on the right, and its picture is far more descriptive than its name. It's 6 hexadec 6 enoic acid. Now, what's quite unusual about this unfatty acid, unsaturated fatty acid is the position of the double bond. It's six carbons from the carboxylate group. This is relatively unique to humans, to have unsaturated fatty acids that have a double bond in the sixth position. Uh, you see that this compound by itself is 5 to 6 percent of skin oil by weight. So it's about half as abundant as squalene. When it reacts with ozone, one of the products, the most abundant volatile product, is decanal. But it's not the only source of decanal in skin oils. These other three unsaturated fatty acids also react with ozone to form decanal. I'd like to now describe a series of experiments that Armin Wisthaler and I have performed to look in more detail at the products that result when ozone reacts with skin oils. Uh, these experiments were conducted both in, in Denmark, at the Technical University of Denmark, and at the University of Innsbruck. And the analytical tool that we used in these experiments is Proton Transfer Reaction Mass Spectrometry, PTRMS. And Armin is a world's expert in applying this technique to monitor organic chemicals in the air. It's very sensitive. You can see in real time compounds down to about 10 parts per trillion. So it's a very powerful technique and it was particularly useful for the studies I'm about to describe. So we began with some very simple experiments. We took clean glass wool and rubbed it 
on either our forehead or the bridge of our nose, or forehead and bridge of nose of, of volunteers. And uh, we placed this soiled glass wool in a, in a Teflon tube, and we passed either clean air through the tube or air containing 100 ppb of ozone through the tube. And the air subsequently flowed into the PTRMS. And we also did controlled experiments with clean glass wool that was not soiled with skin oil. And uh, here you see uh, an example of, of what we observed. If we began with clean glass wool and 100 ppb of ozone, we basically detected nothing. At about 11 minutes in this experiment, we switched the tubes. We switched to a tube that contained soiled glass wool. And you see now acetone grows in, 6-MHO grows in, geronial acetone grows, grows in a little, little more slowly, and decanal grows in. So this is anticipated given the chemicals we know are, are present in skin oil. These are primary products. These are products formed directly from ozone reacting with either squalene or the unsaturated fatty acids. But we also get secondary products, products formed from ozone reacting with these primary products. And that's what you see on this particular slide. You see a series of dicarbonyls, 4-oxopentanal, 4 methyl 8 oxonaninal 1,4-butane diol, 4-octene 1,8 diol. These dicarbonyls that are formed by ozone reacting with primary products. Now notice they grow in in a quite different fashion. They don't rise in concentration as quickly. This is the same experiment that I showed you, so I'll go back. So here we are, the primary products, and you see how quickly they grow in. By 20 minutes, we're close to steady state for everything but geronial acetone. Whereas here, with the secondary products, they're still climbing in concentration at the end of almost an hour. When we move from those simple in vitro experiments to what we'll describe as in vivo experiments, I see Melissa laughing here. You like our reactor on the forehead? Uh, Armin designed this, this little reactor, Teflon enclosure, and we would place it on either the forehead or the cheek or the, uh, or the exposed arm, actually the underarm, and we could pass ozone or clean air through this little enclosure. We worked with uh, both 50 and 100 ppb concentrations of, uh, of ozone. Uh, and uh, in this particular experiment that I'm showing, the reactor was placed on the forehead. It was 50 ppb of ozone. And uh, notice that the time scale is relatively short. We took the reactor off after about eight minutes. We tried to keep these experiments on the, on the shorter side. But you see in this relatively short period, acetone grows in rapidly, 6-MHO, a primary product, grows in rapidly. Decanal comes in more slowly. It's, uh, it's stickier, if you will. And 4-OPA, a secondary product, is only starting to, to rise in concentration at the time when we ended this experiment. If we uh, instead place the reactor on the forehead but pass clean air through, not ozone, the only compound that we see in significant concentrations is acetone. So you see these really are products of ozone-initiated chemistry. This is not residue that happens to be on the skin. Altogether, in these experiments, we identified 18 different gas phase products, carbonyls, dicarbonyls, hydroxycarbonyls. Uh, Three were previously unreported dicarbonyls. Two are tentatively identified as alpha hydroxy ketones. Now, the precursors to these products obviously protect us from oxidants. But do these compounds, does this chemistry have an observable impact on the concentration of oxidants in indoor air? Well, to answer that, We'll begin, I'll begin by describing some experiments, also done at Technical University of Denmark, in a simulation of the most occupied, the most densely occupied environment we typically find ourselves in, an aircraft cabin. And certainly if you're flying in economy, if you're flying in coach, you know just how, how packed in you are. So if you're interested in ozone reacting with human occupants, an aircraft cabin or a simulated aircraft cabin, is a good place to, uh, 
to look for the products of, of the chemistry, look for the effects of the chemistry. Uh, in terms of ozone being present in a cabin in the first place, uh, Bill Nazaroff and uh, Rich Sextro, I saw Rich uh, a moment ago, ah, uh, have actually made measurements on planes. Altogether, you've looked at over 80 flights now, Bill? Yeah, and they can talk to you in gory detail about the kind of levels they've measured on planes. The Seema Bonger, uh, it's been the topic of one of the topics of her PhD dissertation, right? So, so on certain flights, you're exposed to relatively high ozone concentrations. Um, so let me describe the simulated cabin at the Technical University of Denmark. It's uh, configured to resemble a uh, Boeing 767. It's three aisles. For those of you who know the 767, it's two aisles and uh, two, two seats, an aisle, three seats, and an aisle, and two seats. So seven seats across, three rows, 21 seats in total. And again, the major analytical tool we used in this work was PTRMS. Now, initially, we did not have IRB approval to use human subjects. So uh, instead, David Wyan at DTU suggested that we use soiled t-shirts instead. We uh, had male graduate students who volunteered to sleep in freshly washed t-shirts and come in the next morning at 9 and we took the t-shirts off of their backs and put them over the seat backs of the, uh, of the simulated aircraft. Um, in this simulation we were operating the, uh, the cabin at 2.8 air changes an hour with outdoor air. The total air change was 23 air changes an hour. And when ozone was present, it was in the range of uh, 65 to 110 ppb. So let me jump to, to an example of what we observed. This is uh, a continuous four-day period. And on the first day, there were no t-shirts in the cabin and no ozone in the cabin. And we monitored with the PTRMS a uh, total concentration of organics on the order of little less than 40 ppb. On day two, we introduced ozone, still no t-shirts. And you see the ozone reached a value of about 110 ppb, and the organics roughly doubled. They're now about 80 ppb. And this is due to the chemistry initiated by ozone in the cabin without t-shirts. On the third day, no ozone, but the t-shirts are present. And the organics are a little bit higher with the t-shirts present, but not a great deal compared to, to day one. And then on day four, we have ozone and t-shirts together. And what I want to emphasize is that we were generating ozone at the identical rate. On day two and day four, we're generating ozone on, at the identical rate. On day four, with the t-shirts present, the t-shirts soiled with skin oil, the ozone only gets up to about 75. Whereas on day two, it got up to about 110. So these soiled t-shirts were definitely having a very measurable effect on the ozone concentration in the cabin. You also see that the organic concentration is now higher than it was on day two when we had no t-shirts but ozone, and much higher than it was on the first day when we had neither ozone nor t-shirts. On this subject of ozone removal, uh, another way to, to look at it is the first order decay constant for surface removal in the cabin. If you turn off the ozone generators, you can monitor the decay of ozone. And you, it's a very nice first order process, and you can calculate the corresponding first order rate constant. And what you see here is the first order decay when there's no t-shirts in the cabin and the constant is about 9.6 reciprocal hours. This includes exchange with outdoor air. And uh, when the t-shirts are in the cabin, the uh, first order rate constant is 14.4. Again, the same air exchange rate. So the delta is the difference due to the soiled t-shirts, about 5.1 reciprocal hours. A uh, significant difference in the first order rate constant for the, for the ozone removal. Well, eventually we did get approval to use human subjects. And uh, here you see some of the folks from, uh, from DTU, not the uh, actual subjects for, for these experiments. In the experiments, we had 16 passengers. Once again, a total airflow of 23 reciprocal hours. We used two different air exchange rates, outdoor air exchange rates. 
what I'll call the low air exchange rate, 4.4 air changes an hour, and a higher air exchange rate, 8.8 .8 air changes an hour. So in all, we examined four conditions. Low air exchange rate with negligible ozone, or about 60 ppb of ozone, and high air exchange rate with negligible ozone, or about 74 ppb of ozone. And uh, this slide contains a couple of pieces of information. First of all, for one of the high air exchange rate conditions, you can see the ozone level in the cabin in the morning when the generators have been turned on and we've dialed in the ozone for the day. And it got up to about 120 ppb. We then turn off the generators. About one in the afternoon, the passengers enter the cabin and we close the door. The flight officially begins. And now, with 16 passengers present, the ozone only gets up to oh, a little less than 80 ppb. So look at the difference that those 16 passengers have from 120 empty plane down to maybe 78 with those 16 passengers. It's a remarkable effect on the ozone concentration. In terms of the net effect on the first order rate constant for ozone removal, at the low air exchange rate, it's about 6.2 reciprocal hours. At the high ex air exchange rate, it's about 7.4. Don't worry a lot about the difference. There's a fair amount of slop in these numbers, just given the nature of the experiment. But regardless, this is a relatively large difference. That's, that's the point I want to make. And it does certainly have an impact on the chemicals in the air, the chemicals that these human subjects are breathing. When we have no ozone in the cabin and the air exchange rate is low, we have a total concentration of organics of about a little over 70 ppb. When we introduce the ozone, that concentration goes up to over 130. And most of the increase, this striped red section of the bar, most of the increase is due to acids, aldehydes, and ketones, products of ozone-initiated oxidation. And the story is similar at the high air exchange rate. Because it's a higher air exchange rate, the concentrations are lower than at the lower air exchange rate. But again, you introduce ozone, and the concentrations of the organics roughly doubles. And most of the increase is seen in the acids, aldehydes, and ketones. I mentioned that PTRMS allows us to make real-time measurements of the organics, and this is a nice demonstration of its power. At time zero, that's when the <coughs> occupants have just entered the plane and the doors are shut. And it's, the flight is a four-hour flight, and we turn on the ozone generators after we close the door. The black trace shows, shows the increase in carbon dioxide. So that's a, a reference point, if you will. And you see CO2 reaches steady state in about an hour. Now, if you look at a, pr a primary product like 6-MHO, six, six that's the open circles, 6-MHO reaches steady state in a little bit more than an hour. But a secondary product like 4-OPA, that's the black diamonds, the 4-OPA is still climbing at the end of this four hours. And the concentrations are on the y-axis in parts per billion. So you see that these are non-trivial concentrations that we're achieving in this simulated aircraft cabin. Now, uh, one other point I want to make. These are the yields of ozone-derived products at either the low air exchange rate or the high air exchange rate. And four of the five most abundant products are derived from ozone reacting with skin oil. Certainly the reaction with chemicals present on the carpet in the aircraft and with chemicals on the seats, you know, that also contributes to the products. But ozone reacting with skin oils is a very important fraction of the total abundance of, of oxidation products. Okay, let's move from this very densely occupied uh, environment, the aircraft cabin, to something we encounter more frequently. Uh, at least most of us. I know some of, some of you fly a great deal. Uh, but we, we're now going to uh, discuss a simulated office environment. And this is a 30 cubic meter office with two occupants. And again, the experiments were conducted at DTU. The uh, air exchange rate used in these studies was roughly an air change an hour. The offices were sparsely furnished. A couple of ch 
tables, chairs, a few books, a mixing fan, laptops, LCD monitors. Um, and we, we looked at two scenarios. In the first scenario, we imagined a situation where you already have ozone in a room at steady state and two people enter the room and proceed to go about their business. In the second scenario, we imagined a situation where the occupants have entered the office and there's virtually no ozone in the office and over time the ozone levels rise. And that's perhaps the more common situation. You might go into your office in the morning on a day when there's going to be elevated ozone and when you first enter the levels are low but as the photochemistry picks up during the day the ozone levels increase. Well, let me summarize what we found in those two scenarios. So this slide is showing results from the first scenario. And in initially, by the way, the y-axis is parts per billion for 4OPA and 6MHO, but it's, it's ozone levels divided by 10 for ozone. So here's ozone, the blue line, and that's about 33 ppb at the beginning of the experiment. We've reached steady state, it's at 33 ppb. At 10 in the morning, our two occupants enter, and you see immediately the ozone starts to decay. And by 2 in the afternoon, it's down to about 17 ppb from what was initially 33 ppb. At the same time, 6-MHO starts climbing immediately and levels out at about 2.3 ppb in this scenario. And the 4-OPA, a secondary pollutant, continues to climb. And at the time we end the experiment, it's reached just about 2 ppb. So even in this less densely occupied scenario, uh, this chemistry, this ozone skin oil chemistry, is impacting the concentration of ozone and the concentration of these ozone-derived products. Here's the second scenario. And in this scenario, our, initially, we, we see what's in the room, and, and there's very little. Our occupants enter at 10 AM, and they don't have a very large effect on what we're measuring in the room. We turn on the ozone generators at noon, and the blue line is our ozone concentration. And the ozone concentration rises and reaches a level of about 14 ppb. Here at 1.30 in the afternoon, the occupants leave. And when they leave, you can see the ozone immediately starts to rise and gets up to about 20 ppb by the time we concluded the experiment. Uh, you see the 6-MHO started to climb when the occupants entered. And it started to fall almost immediately after the occupants left. But 4-OPA, a secondary pollutant, 4-OPA continued to increase in concentration even after the occupants left. So I think these, these experiments demonstrate um, fairly dramatically that human occupants are, are major ozone sinks. In this office scenario, the two occupants removed ozone with a first order rate constant close to two air changes an hour. Um, a single occupant removed ozone with a first order rate constant of between uh, eight tenths and one air changes an hour. Uh, we can convert that to a clean air delivery rate for those of you who think of filtration devices and who are familiar with, with that metric. And uh, this is equivalent to a, a single occupant is equivalent to a clean air delivery rate for ozone of about 25 to 30 cubic meters per hour. I find that a, still find that a surprisingly large number. Um, a different way of expressing this, in a typically furnished 30 cubic meter room, a single human occupant contributes 10 to 25 percent of the overall ozone removal. Now, uh, there has been some very nice work done here at LBL and Berkeley that adds another component to this story. That's the reactive uptake of ozone on clothing. And on this slide, I just briefly summarize what's a very rich study. Uh, this is work conducted by Bev Coleman and Ugo Destalis and uh, Bill Nazaroff and Al Hodgson. And they looked at different fabrics and they looked at these fabrics either when they were freshly laundered or when they were soiled with skin oils or when they were coated with potassium iodide. 
Potassium iodide loves ozone. They react uh, like a shot. So consider this deposition velocity measured when the clothing is coated with potassium iodide. Consider that the upper limit. Okay? And uh, the first thing I'll point out is that there is a significant difference between clean cotton and soiled cotton, or clean wool and soiled wool, or clean polyester and soiled polyester. Now these skin oils really make a difference in terms of the reaction of the fabrics with, uh, with, with ozone. And uh, you get not that far removed from the upper limit when you start talking about the soiled fabrics. Glenn Morrison and a graduate student, Pond Pondrangi, uh, have done some nice work looking at ozone reacting with human hair. And they find, again, consistent with what we've been talking about, very high reaction for ozone reacting with human hair, both single hair and, and bundles of hair. And uh, deposition velocities that are similar or higher to what we've been dis describing, discussing, and, and this translates to very high reaction probabilities. Another feature that um, Glenn, Glenn Morrison, uh, together with uh, Rim and uh, Attila Novoselic have, uh, have looked at, is this issue of the, the personal microenvironment. You know, as I stand here, there's this thermal plume that's coming up my body because of just the, the temperature difference between my body and, and room air. And, uh, and up till now, I've been discussing core concentrations of ozone or core concentrations of ozone reaction products. But actually, the concentration of ozone or the concentration of reaction products in our breathing zone could differ significantly from the core concentration because of this thermal plume. I'm, if I'm simply standing here or sitting here, this thermal bloom, imagine the room contains ozone. The ozone is coming up across these surfaces that are soiled with skin oil, being depleted as it travels up to my breathing zone. But at the same time, oxidation products are forming, and those oxidation products are enriched relative to the concentrations in the core of the room. So, these authors, these researchers, did CFD simulations. This particular slide is showing results at half an air change an hour. And in the breathing zone, they found that the ozone concentration was roughly a third the ozone concentration at the inlet air. Uh, so quite, quite an effect. And concomit concomitantly, uh, not shown on this slide, is higher concentrations of oxidation products in the breathing zone than in the core of the room. Uh, I think this is an important consideration and I think it's an area that really uh, warrants further study and I think indeed I, I know several research groups are paying attention to exactly this issue. How the thermal plume influences our personal exposure to, uh, to chemicals, expo especially um, oxidation products and, uh, and oxidants. Well, I'd, up till now, I've been talking about ozone. But there's two other important oxidants in indoor air, potentially important oxidants. That's the hydroxyl radical and the nitrate radical. And given the nature of this chemistry, we anticipate that these products have the potential to influence the concentration of both hydroxyl radicals and nitrate radicals in indoor air. 6-MHO reacts with ozone at a very fast rate, and one of the products at a yield that's close to unity is the hydroxyl radical. Geronyl acetone reacts with ozone at roughly the same rate, also producing hydroxyl radical. So these two primary products can be a source of hydroxyl radical indoors when they, as a consequence of, of this ozone-initiated chemistry. At the same time, they're very efficient at scavenging the hydroxyl radical. 6-MHO and geronyl acetone react with the hydroxyl radical at a very high rate. They also react with the nitrate radical at a high rate. And then there's other products that are less efficient sinks for the hydroxyl and nitrate radical, but still should be considered if you're looking at the overall picture of the sources and sinks of these radicals in the indoor air. Now, 
what I'm about to describe is a modeling study, not experimental work. We really need more measurements of these species in indoor air, but that's another topic. Um, in this modeling study, it's a simple one compartment mass balance model. We're assuming a 30 cubic meter room ventilated at one air change an hour. Um, We've modeled the concentration, the mixing ratio of OH and nitrate radical for both an unoccupied scenario and an occupied scenario, two occupants. And uh, in the first scenario, we've assumed average levels of terpenes and terpene alcohols. In the second scenario, we've assumed low levels of terpene and terpene alcohols. And the reason for this will be more apparent in a moment. Uh, we've assumed that unoccupied, the level of ozone is 34 ppb, that occupied it's 20 ppb, and that the NO2 concentration, occupied or unoccupied, oh, a chance to install Apple software. I think I'll say no. Uh, and, uh, and the NO2 concentration, we've assumed, is relatively unaffected by occupancy. So, um, the, at steady state, uh, we can estimate the hydroxyl radical concentration as simply the sum of the sources divided by the sum of the sinks. And it turns out when you start looking at the contributions for the, from the various sources that this term, which covers outdoor to indoor transport of hydroxyl radical, this term is negligible. We, we don't have to include it. And uh, indoor to outdoor transport of hydroxyl is a negligible sink. And removal of hydroxyl by indoor surfaces is also a negligible sink. So this expression reduces to this expression and uh, we can estimate um, using this relatively simple expression uh, steady state concentrations of hydroxyl radical. So when we do that exercise for the first scenario with average levels of terpenoids, I'll jump to the bottom line, we see virtually no difference between an empty room and a room with two occupants. We estimate a hydroxyl radical concentration of around 3.5 times 10 to the fifth molecules per cubic centimeter. Now, it turns out that when the room is occupied, two of the five most important sources of OH are 6-MHO and geronyl acetone. But these compounds also are very important sinks. So it's roughly a wash in an occupied room in the case of OH if we're talking about average ter terpenoid levels. Now, I should point out that in the empty room, these terpenes are very important sources of OH. Limonene is the most important source. Alpha terpenine, the second most important source. Linalool, the third most important source. Alpha pinene, the fifth most important source. So, and, and I'm using average terpene concentrations in this model. Average of averages, actually. And as you can appreciate, the model is fairly sensitive to what you assume for the terpene concentrations. Um, but, but the point is that terpene levels really have a very strong impact on OH levels. And if you've got average terpene concentrations, the impact of the occupants isn't that important. But if we're talking about low terpene levels, Say you're an individual who doesn't like scented products, who doesn't use air fresheners, who tries to avoid sources of terpenes and terpene alcohols. Well, in that scenario, occupancy turns out to be quite important. In the empty room, we calculate a hydroxyl radical concentration of about uh, 0.6 times 10 to the fifth molecules per cubic meter. But with two occupants, it's roughly five times larger. And with occupants present, the importance of 6-MHO and geronyl acetone as a source is, you know, it's, it's, it's there. Uh, and yes, it's a sink as well, but, but, but now it's, it's more important as a source than, than as a sink. Well, in a similar fashion, we can look at nitrate radicals indoors, and uh, we have a similar steady state expression. Now the only source that we're considering for indoor nitrate radicals is the reaction between ozone and NO2. But we have many different sinks, the different organic compounds in indoor air that react with nitrate radical. In the first scenario, with average terpene levels, even, even here, average terpene levels, occupancy has an impact. The nitrate radical concentration is close to 0.7 ppt 
without occupants, it goes down to about 0.2 ppt with two occupants present. And if we go to the scenario with low terpenoid levels, well now the impact is very large. Occupants are really very important sinks, the dominant sink in the scenario for nitrate radical. As a matter of fact, you can say in a sense that occupants set an upper limit on the level of nitrate radicals indoors. This particular graph summarizes the results of the modeling I've just been describing. So on the, the left of the black, black line, we have average terpene conditions. An empty room and an occupied room. We see the ozone level goes down with occupancy. We see the hydroxyl radical remains relatively unaffected. We see the nitrate radical goes down with occupancy. And then for the low terpene situation, we see ozone goes down, we see hydroxyl goes up, we see nitrate radical going down about a factor of nine. So, so under the right conditions, occupancy really does have an impact, not just on ozone, but on hydroxyl and nitrate radicals. Human occupants really do impact the overall oxidative capacity of indoor air. Well, now let's talk a little bit about something quite different, semi-volatile organic compounds. And I mentioned at the beginning of the talk uh, examples that you're familiar with of SVOCs, uh, plasticizers, flame retardants, pesticides, antioxidants, phthalate esters, brominated uh, flame retardants, um, permethrins. What is remarkably underappreciated, I think, is the potential role of direct air to human transport of SVOCs in terms of human exposure to SVOCs. Um, Bill and I, Bill Nazaroff and I, estimate a mass transfer coefficient for SVOC uptake on skin, hair, and clothing somewhere in the range of five to 10 <coughs> meters per hour. And this is taking into account the uh, thermal plume and the reduced boundary layer is a consequence of the thermal plume. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the surface area of a human is on the order of two square meters. So if we simply multiply these two values, we see that the volumetric processing rate of SVOCs by a human is somewhere in the range of nine to 20 cubic meters per hour. A fairly large number. So, one could envision humans walking into a room containing SVOCs and actually impacting the levels of the SVOCs in room air. But in this mental model, there are several caveats that it's important to pay attention to. First of all, we're only going to remove SVOCs that were not present on our human envelope before we walked into the room. Um, you know, we may already be equilibrated with certain SVOCs before we walk into the room. In some cases, we might be a source of different SVOCs. If, if the levels uh, in our skin oils is higher than the levels that would be in equilibrium with those in, in room air. Um, additionally, it's only initially that the occupants are going to be a sink for these SVOCs. Over time, the levels will grow in the skin oils until you've equilibrated and the human occupant is no longer uh, a net sink or source. Um, this particular plot shows what we estimate to be the maximum, if you will, hypothetical impact of humans on three common SVOCs. Uh, this is a 30 cubic meter room, half an air change an hour. We're assuming the concentration of airborne particles is 20 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, we're assuming that the, when the room is empty, uh, we're at steady state as far as the SVOCs are concerned. And the red bars, which is when the room is occupied with two humans, that's roughly 20 minutes after the humans enter. So long enough that we've started to approach steady state, but short enough that the humans haven't equilibrated with the SVOCs in the room. And uh, in the case of, this is di 2 ethohexyl phthalate in the gas phase. You see the difference between unoccupied and occupied. DEHP associated with airborne particles. 
uh, assuming partitioning, standard partitioning between the gas phase and airborne particles. This is similar data for dienbutyl phthalate, a common plasticizer, gas phase particles, uh, more DNA, DNBP in the gas phase and associated with airborne particles, and butylated hydroxytoluene, BHT, you know, the antioxidant in Wonder Bread, but it's also an antioxidant in a lot of other materials and fairly common indoors. And uh, so this, this is the maximum anticipated level on the SVO, anticipated impact on SVOC levels. Um, but what we also want to think about is um, just the kind of, of levels that result on our surface as a result of direct air to skin transfer. Um, we can calculate an equilibrium level of a given SVOC in skin surface lipids uh, by using uh, an equilibrium constant that I'll call K sub Hume and, uh, and the gas phase concentration. The product of the gas phase concentration and this partitioning coefficient will give you a concentration you anticipate in the skin surface lipids. And uh, we can estimate K Hume from the octanol air partition coefficient. So it's, it's relatively straightforward. And uh, we actually have a large set of experimental data that we can test this very simple approach against. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency performed a large study. I'll refer to it as the CTEP study. Here they measured various semi-volatile organic compounds in the gas phase associated with settled dust and on hands, hand wipes. Uh, they made these measurements in Ohio and North Carolina. They made the measurements for children both at home and in the daycare centers and uh, in adults at home. So uh, the particular SVOCs that we had data for are listed in this column. I think you can read them, even those of you in the back of the room. And uh, what, we've, what I'm showing on, on this slide is a concentration on the surface of the hands that we calculate using the simple expression I just showed versus the concentration that was measured by the researchers as part of the CTEP study. And these are children. We've assumed a surface concentration for the uh, skin lipids of 80 micrograms per square centimeter. And what you see is what I feel is a remarkably good agreement between, between what we estimate and what has been measured. And these semi-volatile organic compounds have octanol air partition coefficients that vary over four orders of magnitude. Okay, their volatilities are quite different. These are the results for the adults, 194 separate hand wipes, and again, uh, a remarkably good agreement between what we estimate with this simple expression and what's measured on the hands. And this, I, this is telling us that you know, direct air to skin transport does really appear to be an important pathway. And, and then, of course, the question is, well, once these SVOCs are sorbed to our skin oils, what about crossing and eventually getting into the capillary bed? You know, that, that's another issue. But dermal exposures for the right type of compounds uh, could be a very important exposure pathway. Um, now, there is a puzzle in this data. We can estimate the time required to achieve equilibrium absorption. And for compounds that are relatively volatile, for compounds that have a moderate value of the octanol air partition coefficient, we estimate on the order of minutes to hours to equilibrate. On the other hand, for compounds that have very large values for KOA, values larger than about 10 to the 10th, and some of the compounds on this slide have large KOAs, there we estimate that days or months are required to equilibrate. And yet we see results that are consistent with an equilibrated system. So how do we reconcile this uh, conflict between what we calculate as the time required to achieve equilibrium and the fact that we observe what appears to be equilibrium, equilibrium in, these, in these hand wipes for compounds where we don't anticipate it? Um, at this point, it's an open question. I mean, ideas that may help to explain it, you know, is the mass transfer coefficient enhanced in some fashion by airborne particles that, that uh, well, we, uh, or by human motion itself? I'm waving my hands right now. That can't be too large an effect. By contact, uh, 
I see Ashok shaking his head here. <laughs> okay, onward to what humans leave behind. Desquamation. I like that word. Desquamation uh, refers to our shedding of our skin cells. Every two to four weeks, we shed our, we, our entire our outer layer of, of, uh, of skin, our, our stratum corneum, to be more, more specific. Um, if you can read it, the desquamation rate here is 5 times 10 to the 8th cells per day for a typical adult. Now, these skin flakes, again, for an adult, they're relatively, each flake has a relatively small mass, a couple of nanograms, but we're shedding lots of them. So we're shedding skin flakes at about 30 to 90 milligrams an hour. We're shedding 200,000 to 600,000 skin flakes a minute. I mean, that's happening right now, you know, in this room while we sit here. We're, we're leaving ourselves, parts of ourselves in this room. Um, these skin flakes contain skin oils. And uh, Clark and Shirley have actually measured uh, squalene at about 1% by weight in the skin flakes that we're describing. So given the fact that desquamation occurs, when we anticipate that skin oils are part of indoor environments that have been occupied by human beings? Well, to look at this, um, we've taken advantage of a large study that's ongoing in Denmark. Uh, it's formally titled Indoor Environment and Children's Health. This is a brief study brief summary of that study. In part one, 17,500 questionnaires were sent to all of the families on the island of Foon with children between the ages of one and five. And uh, the questionnaire dealt with the child's health history, diet, home environmental factors. In part two of the study, 500 children were selected. 200 of them have allergies or asthma, they're considered cases. 300 of the children are what we describe as bases, and they are randomly selected. So we have 500 children, and these children have received detailed physicals, but germane to what I'm describing here, we've also done detailed investigations of their homes and daycare centers. And as part of this effort, dust samples have been collected from the children's bedrooms and from the daycare centers. The dust was vacuumed from non-floor surfaces onto pre-cleaned filters. We paid a great deal of attention into regarding contamination issues, regarding QA, QC. And uh, we subsequently analyzed the dust for phthalates, phthalate esters, for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, for nicotine, and selected other SVOCs, including squalene. This was an opportunity to see if we could actually see squalene in these dust samples. And indeed, we really did see squalene in these dust samples. This is for the samples from the children's bedrooms. I'll remind you, 500 samples in total. You see that the mass fractions of squalene and dust are nicely log normally distributed. The geometric mean is close to 30 micrograms per, per gram. That's a relatively large value. That's Squalene is the third most abundant SVOC we identified in these dust samples. The only more abundant compounds were di-2-ethyl phthalate and cholesterol. So cholesterol is also elevated, but it looks like cholesterol has sources other than skin oils. It looks like cooking is contributing to the cholesterol and perhaps outdoor vegetation. But again, I, I digress. Here's the squalene levels in the daycare center, about 10 micrograms per gram geometric mean. Interesting that the levels in the daycare center are lower than the levels in the bedroom. But remember, the daycare centers are only occupied part of the day. Um, there's a number of possible explanations for, for why this difference between bedrooms and daycare centers. But the fact is that in both environments, squalene levels are significant. Now, this slide actually goes back to, to work that Ashok and Bill and I did in 1991, where we we're looking at deposition velocities of different substances indoors and outdoors. And we began by looking at deposition velocities of ozone 
to different surfaces in chamber studies. And the point I'm trying to make on this slide is that different surfaces remove ozone with very different deposition velocities. It's about two orders of magnitude difference here between aluminum at 32% RH and gypsum board. Okay? And yet, if you turn around and you look at overall deposition velocities that are measured in indoor environments, the range of values is remarkably small. Uh, I've summarized some of the major studies here. This particular study by Kiyung Lee and co-workers measured uh, deposition velocities in 43 homes in Southern California. And you see they got a value of 1 plus or minus roughly 0.5 for these 43 homes. But you can see for yourself the range of values. So given that individual surfaces have such differences in terms of scavenging ozone, you know, why is it that the overall deposition velocity in these different indoor environments is so similar? Well, over time, do these indoor surfaces that start out different from one another, over time, do they accumulate skin flakes and skin oils from those skin flakes? Does a glass surface and a carpet surface, which began as different surfaces, over time, do they more and more resemble one another on a microscopic level because of soiling by skin flakes and skin oils? Well, something to consider and to look at more closely. So, to conclude, I find it startling the extent to which these interfacial reactions between ozone and uh, constituents of human skin oil determine indoor levels of oxidants, ozone, the hydroxyl radical, the nitrate radical, as well as oxidation products resulting from this chemistry we've been describing. I find it remarkable the extent to which direct air to skin transfer of SVOCs appears to be important in terms of the dermal burden that, that we carry of different SVOCs. And I find it remarkable the extent to which we, the human occupants, wind up contaminating, if you will, these environments we occupy. And, uh, and you know, perhaps this, this commonality that, that surfaces move towards. This, this perhaps helps us in general ways address issues indoors. Um, I think these, these different aspects, it's important to keep them in mind when we address building energy use and consider the implications uh, of, of changing the way the building operates and how the occupants themselves interact with the environment they occupy. And I know that later today and tomorrow, I'll be a, talking about exactly this issue with, with some of you in this room. Um, last but not least, I want to acknowledge my, my co-workers, many individuals who, who made these studies I've described possible. You recognize a lot of LBNL initials here, uh, and of course, a lot of DTU initials. And uh, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to work with the individuals listed on, on this slide. And I thank you very much for your patience and uh, attention this afternoon. So wanting to think about this from the practical standpoint, um, ozone exists. We can't uh, we can't turn the sun off. Uh, we're not likely to reduce the amount of uh, emissions of uh, organics into the ambient air. So we're going to have ozone around us. Um, we're not getting rid of our skin, so we will have squalene. Um, what do we do? I like that question, Mike. Um, because your, your question makes the very important point that even if we're incredibly careful in terms of what we bring into our homes, the products we use in our homes. Ozone-initiated chemistry is still going to occur because of us, the occupants. Um, so to me, one of the things you do in mechanically ventilated buildings, if you are concerned about what we've described and exposure to products of ozone-initiated chemistry, you remove ozone from the ventilation air. 
That's, that's one of the things you do, as, as is done on aircraft. You know, about half of the planes flying, more than half of the planes flying, actually do take ozone out of the bleed air, out of the, out of the ventilation air. And there are techniques today to take ozone out of ventilation air. But you need a mechanically ventilated building because you need to be able to put a charcoal filter or something like that in place. There's also the potential to remove ozone passively in a building that isn't ventilated. And uh, Glenn Morrison and Rich Corsi have been looking at exactly that issue, different, different ways in which you might realistically and, and, and to some effect remove ozone passively. Uh, from a building that doesn't have mechanical ventilation. But I, think, I think that's the obvious thing to do, is to try and take ozone out of the air you're using for ventilation. Question there, Mike. Yeah, hi. Uh, Ken Bogan uh, from Exponent now. Um, you mentioned uh, you observed uh, apparent equilibrium values for um, VLCs uh, like uh, dibutyl phthalate uh, and uh, human skin. And the, the, you mentioned uh, a, a desquamation rate on the order of uh, once every two to four weeks. But uh, there's an expectation that dibutyl phthalate has a substantial permeability rate. And uh, the question is, might it not be possible to infer from uh, data you could obtain on, e on uh, apparent equilibrium value for dibutyl phthalate in, uh, in squalene from skin on uh, what the permeability coefficient is for a compound like dibutyl phthalate, uh, similar to how uh, um, uh, permeability coefficients are uh, uh, determined for, uh, say, rats exposed to uh, volatile compounds in a chamber. Yeah. Uh, certainly. And, uh, and there are researchers who are involved in exactly that effort, uh, who are measuring uh, penetration rates for these different organic compounds, semi-volatile organic compounds, we know to be present on the surface of our skin. Uh, so it is an area of active research. I think a very important area of research. And I, I think quite interestingly, there's an there's, uh, individual named John Kissel, who some of you know, and he, he does research in this area. And he feels that some of the current values in the literature for penetration are unrealistically low because of the methods by which the penetration rate has been determined. And he feels that when you start talking about realistic concentrations, rather than the kind of concentrations that have been used in experiments to measure the, the rate at which uh, penetration occurs, that, that the rates are indeed higher. At any rate, this is a very important issue. And it comes, comes back to just how important or unimportant the dermal pathway is in terms of our overall exposure to these chemicals. Um, if, we, if, if we think about the phthalate esters and we consider major routes of exposure, you think about food, you think about inhalation, um, you think of ingestion of dust as opposed to, to food, and you think about the dermal pathway. And you make some back of the envelope calculations. And the dermal pathway for some of these compounds could be the dominant pathway if the penetration is large enough. Just to that, uh, uh, back when uh, I was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab with uh, Tom McCone and did dermal uptake uh, experiments in vivo uh, uh, using hairless guinea pig and then subsequently using accelerator mass spec to examine human surgical tissue, um, we found that uh, the in vivo measures of uh, KP values uh, systematically were greater than those that are deduced using in vitro methods. And we published a paper in 1994 in, in the Journal of Exposure Analysis um, uh, on that very issue of systematic bias if you compare to in vivo measures. And this was uh, largely aqueous systems 
Uh, but here you have a, a chance to do it uh, uh, from air, uh, make it in vivo, and it would be very interesting to see if you reach the same conclusion. Thank you. It, it's Larry Gondo. Uh, I infer from what you said that we could produce a standard surface for standard in quotes surface that models a lot of the indoor environment by coming up with the right concoction of, of squalene, um, one of the phthalates and cholesterol. Uh, we could here, for example, try to use that as a monitor of um, reactive oxygen species, uh, say. So am I correct in assuming there might be some value for a standard measure of the, uh, uh, the our characterization of a building using such a coded surface, for example? I, I think, Laura, there is potential value there. Um, we've done a modeling of the redistribution of SBOCs in indoor environments from their original source or use into other indoor compartments. So, uh, so from vinyl flooring into the gas phase and airborne particles and onto exposed surfaces, window films. Uh, we've, you and I have talked about this in, in, in the past. And, uh, and if you use the octanol air partition coefficient and make some assumption about um, how, how much organic matter is sorbed to indoor surfaces, you can, you can get results that, that certainly make sense, you know, that pass the laugh test. Uh, can we improve this modeling effort uh, by talking about something, by, by talking about that organic matter uh, instead of being similar to octanol, being similar to the kind of con concoction you describe? I think it yeah. comes from your slides. It comes from your slides yeah. or, and what you said about what was the most important or the most dominant, yeah. most prevalent species. So, uh, I'm, I'm watching the clock here uh, and I want to uh, allow interaction to continue but call this uh, to a final close. I want to thank you for a really stimulating, exciting, and penetrating look <laughs> at the indoor chemistry as it penetrates into the skin of our, <laughs> our bodies. So thank you very much, and I want a round of applause.